thirsty All who are we Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life The pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out Today we sing Come Lord Jesus Come Come Lord Jesus Come All who are thirsty Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out true Welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Ihoma. I am the Director of Compassion and Justice Ministries here at the River. I want to say a special welcome to all those who are watching the live stream from all over the country. Every Sunday, it is my joy to hop on to YouTube to the chat live stream function and get to greet you and say hello to your families, hear a little bit of your stories. So just a special welcome to all those who are joining us today. Um, in a few minutes, Mich Pastor Michelle will continue on this new series that we've started about taming the wild beast in our world, in particular, the wild beast of weariness. And before she shares, I just have two short announcements for us. The first is for the 1619 Project, or 1619 Roundtable, I should say. It is based on the New York Times 1619 Project, um, and I'll be co-leading these discussions with Kayloon. They'll go for about 10 Sundays. It's a 10-week sort of semester group. And it examines the consequences of slavery, the contributions of Black Americans to our history, and particularly the ways that this narrative and story impacts all of our stories, our own identities and histories. And I'm excited to get to know you, to share with you, to um, have that discussion lens for us to explore together. So please sign up if you haven't already. We'll begin next Sunday evening. The second announcement is for event happening tomorrow evening, um, February the 1st, Monday, February the 1st at 6.30. The River will be co-sponsoring with Spark Church, a discussion with author Jamar Tisby. 
Jamar is perhaps famously known for his book, The Color of Compromise. And if you were part of that really exciting discussion that we had, I guess, last year, two years ago, it was such an exciting and informative um, discussion. So I'm really looking forward to tomorrow night. Again, it'll be on YouTube. You can check out the links right below. But I'm excited to gain new tools for pursuing reconciliation, for pursuing justice in our world, in our nation, in our church, and want to invite you to join us in that. Let me pray for us as we welcome Pastor Michelle. Lord, I am newly aware of the weariness this week in the midst of really exciting news like older relatives getting the vaccine and confusing news with our stock market and all that's happening. Um, I have felt a new level of weariness with our pandemic and even weariness in my own coping responses of reaching for my phone in the morning or various things that contribute to this weary feeling. We ask that you would position and ready our hearts for Pastor Michelle's teaching, that we'd be able to receive these tools for taming the beast of weariness. And we ask for transformation. Certainly transformation outwardly in our world, but that inward transformation of your spirit, of your presence, of your awareness, that in the midst of this COVID pandemic, we might live really um, renewed lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. It's good to be with you again this week as we continue to look squarely at some of the enemies of the soul, those things that we're naming as the wild beasts of the pandemic season, in order that we would be prepared to fend them off when they come our way. If you tuned in last week, you know that the first beast that we named in this um, pandemic season is the beast that goes by the name weariness. Have you seen this enemy? Middle schooler Jack Bauer was spot on in helping us to visualize it, I think. So I don't know about you, but I can actually see myself in this picture. Like this guy, I feel grateful to be largely functional still after nearly a year of pandemic li living. I get up most days, shower, get dressed, get my cup of tea, set off to my desk, like it might just be a pretty normal day. Until almost before I know what's happened, I often find I'm face flat on the floor again. Thankfully, not usually literally, but certainly metaphorically. And what I notice is that it doesn't take nearly as much as it used to, to take me down. Just the whiff of possibility of more bad news. Or, frankly, frustrating technical challenges can do it. Some days, just the awareness that there's no milk in the house, and wham, down I go. It's like I've lost all my stamina, which really shouldn't be a surprise, because that's precisely the strategy of the beast of weariness. The wild beast of weariness is not to be underestimated or taken lightly and not just because it could ruin any one day, but because it seeks to render us weak for life's larger battles. Weariness is a giant blob seeking to glom onto your ankles to pull you down and out. It exhausts you in a deep down kind of way, taking your strength, your endurance, your vigor, your freshness, Experts tell us that weariness results in significant part because of our being on guard all the time. Vigilance, that experience of being on guard, is an important life skill. It's what helps us to survive in the face of threats. But it's really best used in small doses. Too much of it backfires us on us entirely. Our physical and our mental well-being is significantly compromised in prolonged periods of being on guard. So we need to learn practices that cut weariness off at its source. 
simple but consistent spiritual practices around things like waking and sleeping. We talked last week about the significance of our first move of the day and how many of us have a reflex toward our phones as that first move of the day, which is understandable given all that's been dynamic in our world over the last year, but it doesn't serve us well. It gets us right back on being amped up and on guard because of the barrage of news headlines and facing the, the decisions that are ahead of us in any day. So I hope that you've been experimenting perhaps with a fresh first move this week, something that turns your eyes and your hopes toward God at the beginning of the day, something that gives you power to resist that sucking force of weariness. Similarly, how we end the day has the power to keep us either turned toward or turned away from the wild beast of weariness. The exhaustion of weariness goes beyond the tiredness of any one poor night of sleep. But nonetheless, poor sleep over time and a general um, lack of, of rest in our lives weakens us in the battle against weariness. And unfortunately, the statistics about Americans and sleep were not great to begin with, and they've actually only worsened during the pandemic. In fact, I learned this week that there is a word uh, for the sleep disturbance that many of us have begun to experience or maybe have found exacerbated in our lives over the course of this last year. Have you heard this word, coronasomnia? A Washington Post article I read documented that prescriptions for sleep medications in the U.S. jumped 15% just between February and March in 2020. And at the UCLA Sleep Disorder Center, the number of patients complaining of insomnia rose 20 to 30%. So there are tons of forms and facets to not sleeping well medical and psychological underpinnings, as well as just a variety of sleep temperaments. We have both easy sleepers and sleep challenged ones in our house. And likewise, there's lots of easily accessible and really helpful tips out there about how to pursue better sleep. Today though, I wanna focus our attention to the spiritual practice of rest which I believe actually undergirds all of that practical wisdom that's there for our taking. Because the insights around the spiritual practice of rest are what we need in order to be fortified in the fight against weariness. And similar to many of Jesus's principles for how life works, his principles around uh, the spiritual practices of rest are somewhat counterintuitive. If weariness gets increasing access to us, the longer we remain mentally, emotionally, and physiologically on guard, one of the best ways to cut weariness off and its influence in our life is actually to let our guard down, which is what we do when we rest. Now, if you've been convinced that there are real dangers out there in these days worthy of being called wild beasts, you may object at this point that this is foolish input. Never let your enemies see your weakness, right? And letting your guard down in the face of threats is foolish unless, unless there is another who can stand guard for you. Listen to the words of Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Another translation of that final phrase, which I really appreciate, could be, 
for he, for God, provides for his beloved during sleep. Ending the day and entering into sleep often provokes feelings of vulnerability for many of us. And we much prefer to feel ourselves powerful and strong, which is why we work hard and we stand on guard and we do all that we can to prepare for every contingency we can think of. The problem is that we can only keep that up for so long. Ultimately, we hit up against the reality that we are limited creatures. Weariness will catch up with us and we will find ourselves flat on our face again. We need to rest and we can rest most fully when we know that we rest in capable hands. God's promise to those that he loves, to you and to me, is to stand guard for us and to provide for us while we sleep. We will have what we need for the, the battle against weariness and for the bigger battles of our day as we learn to trust in the competent care of God and rest. The confidence that we're after is expressed well in Psalm 4, verse 8. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Similarly, Jesus is really our model for what it looks like to rest as a result of trust. If you're familiar with the stories of the life of Jesus, you are probably familiar with the story of him sleeping in a boat in the midst of a wild storm. The Gospel of Mark describes it this way. On that day when evening had come, he, referring to Jesus, said to them, referring to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Just take a minute and, and picture that in your mind's eye. There's these huge winds blowing, rocking this little boat, and water crashing in from the sides. But it says, Jesus was asleep in the stern asleep on the cushion. The story goes on to say, the disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? I think it's easy for us to read Jesus' response to his disciples there at the end as a, a stinging rebuke and be sort of left with that feeling at the end of the story. And there is a rebuke there for the disciples, but I also hear Jesus putting to words what he's just demonstrated with his body. God can be trusted. God can be trusted. And in the middle of the raging storms of life, we can sleep because God can be trusted. As our confidence in God grows, we're helped to let down our guard and rest, admitting that we're only going to be able to stand in the fight against weariness as we uh, uh, surrender ourselves into the capable hands of God regularly for rest. And one of the best ways to exercise that kind of faith, to stretch our faith muscles, is actually to put ourselves in practice with the conventional wisdom around good sleep habits. We need to learn to sleep. Anyone who has parented babies and, and toddlers knows this. Few of us arrive into this world 
knowing how to sleep. It's a skill that's learned. And even now as adults, we need to continue to train our bodies to rest with simple practices uh, like a wind down routine, which is about number one on the list of sleep hygiene habits. So maybe uh, you're well familiar with the idea of a wind down routine before sleep, but now is the time in this extended season of high alert to renew that practice or to begin it if you haven't had it before. In fact, the website uh, sleepfoundation.org says that given the stress of the pandemic, you actually need to give yourself extra wind down time each night. We are generally so wound up that we are needing an extra amount of time to wind down and let our bodies release into sleep. So what are the best practices here? You may be well familiar with them. Bottom line, we need to draw a line about when and how we're gonna turn off productivity and entertainment in our day. When and how we're gonna turn off productivity and entertainment in our day. Now, if you want a real stretch goal here, there are people who advocate for doing this starting at sundown. But I'm guessing for most of us, going for the conventional wisdom of beginning the wind down process about an hour before you actually go to sleep would be plenty stretch enough. So it begins with um, turning off productivity, which is harder for us now in the days of pandemic, where many, if not most of us, are doing our work in our homes, some of us in our bedrooms. So we need different cues than perhaps we used to have like leaving the office to communicate, I'm clocking out now and I'm entering in to rest. Perhaps a daily ritual of covering your workspace with a towel would be that kind of communication uh, to your space and to your inner being that you are turning off productivity. You might experiment with changing the light in your environment turning down the bright lights, going towards something that's um, more dim, maybe lighting some candles. But whatever you do, you need to do something which communicates, I am done being on guard and I am entering into rest. Similarly, we need to have practices for um, turning off entertainment at the end of the day. The, the watching of media, the sometimes endless scrolling on our phones, I like the way that Christian author and thinker Andy Crouch talks about this as a principle in his book, The TechWise Family. He says, our devices go to bed before we do. Our devices go to bed before we do. We turn off that blue light, which can inhibit sleep from coming. And we also stop that more intensive stimuli that keep our brains revving and often anxious. And then once productivity and entertainment have been shut down, the invitation is there for us to enter into some form of end of day reflection and prayer. I emphasized last week that a practice like that is not intended in any way to be an opportunity to prove yourself toward God, nor is it intended to be a big burden. It doesn't have to be particularly long or strenuous. It just needs to be consistent. So choose something that suits you. It could be uh, writing in a gratitude journal. It could be reviewing the day with the prayer of examine. Or it could be the simple joining in with a written prayer for the evening. Followers of Jesus throughout the ages have marked their days by particular times of prayer. And that final time in a uh, fixed hour prayer is known as Compline, evening prayer. I've heard Compline described in very inviting terms as a great way to tuck yourself in at night. You could find a whole variety of Compline prayers online that might catch with you, but this is one that I appreciate. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, 
and asleep, we may rest in peace. Amen. Experiment and see what works best for you. What helps you enter into rest that ultimately empowers you to fend off the beast of weariness that is coming for us in these days? Because ultimately each of us do need to figure out what works for us in these practices of waking and sleeping, I wanted you to hear at least one personal story of someone in our midst who has begun practicing these things and how it is that they're helping her uh, in these days. Hey friends, Michelle asked me to share what habits I've been practicing in the mornings and in the evenings. I call them habits because the sheepish part of me feels like it's too lofty to call them spiritual practices. And I've been doing these for months now, way before I knew we were going to start this series or that I was actually taming a wild beast named weariness. So here's the backstory. In the fall, as the pandemic dragged on and I was anticipating the start of the school year, the ministry year, I started feeling like I needed to make some changes in my daily routines. The days were just bleeding into one another and I was feeling sluggish. Pre-COVID, there were simple routines just kind of naturally built into the day that gave my day structure and order. Simple things like packing a lunch, driving to school, dropping my kid off at school, wishing him a good day, driving to the office in a peaceful, quiet car. But when everything was at home during this pandemic, it just felt like I had all my hats on all the time. I would start a project and then get distracted or get interrupted. There was just a complete lack of focus. And on top of that, I felt like I was spending way too much time on my phone, you know, just scrolling through the news and social media, playing online games. So when the fall hit, I, I was really hoping for better habits. And to be honest, what I really wanted was a better version of myself. So I started by setting screen time limits. We had them for our 10 year old and I knew I needed them for myself. So I set the downtime to be 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. And I gave myself just 15 minutes of Facebook a day. And I stopped reading the news as much as I could and I started reading books. Now the temptation was still there first thing in the morning to reach for my phone. And some days, I'll be honest, I woke up past 8 a.m. So technically it was okay, but I knew I wanted to start my day with something better. So I did what's called a habit stacking. This is where you take a habit that you're already doing and you place another one on top of it. And so for me in the morning, that was making coffee. I make coffee every morning, right? So as I was grinding the beans and pouring the hot water and then stirring in the cream and sugar, I said my affirmations and a prayer for the day. Now, affirmations are basically truths that I repeated to myself. It's things like, I am God's beloved daughter. Today is going to be an amazing day. I choose my own attitude. Now, I know these sound a little cheesy, and at first, they were cheesy to me. But you know what? They really work because you are speaking truth into your life. You are speaking biblical truth and you're just speaking truth about how you want to posture the day. Now, in the evenings, instead of, you know, laying in bed, playing games, um, I would read. And then I would turn the lights off. I thought about my day. I, I thank God for things. And sometimes I just listen to a couple songs and then I would just go to bed. Some nights I didn't even read. I just turned the lights off, laid there, thought about my day and went to bed. Now, I found that with new habits, you need to make them really simple for you to do them. Perfection is not the key. The key is repetition. Consistency is the victory. I've been doing these for 90 plus days now, and I can say I feel more centered and grounded. I appreciate what Michelle said last Sunday. How we start the day affects how we face the day and how the day impacts us. I found that to be so true. By starting the day with a positive attitude, I was able to face the day with just a more positive lens. You know, what we feed our minds is powerful. Junk in becomes junk out. 
And how we think affects our emotions and our behaviors. So I am learning to hold every thought captive, and I feel closer to God as a result of just these simple waking, sleeping habits, because I start the day acknowledging God's presence with me, who I am, what my identity as his beloved daughter, and I end the day with just a sense of gratitude for the gifts he's given me in my life. Friends, the wild beast of weariness is lurking, but we are not defenseless against it. Angela shared really practically how we can build practices in our life around sleeping and waking that fortify us for this fight. So I want to commend to you again, making a plan for how it is that you will stand against the beast of weariness in our day. I'd love to pray for you as I send you into a greater reflection and a time of worship. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the image of you asleep in the boat in the midst of the storm. Lord, help us to train to be like you in that way to find ourselves safe in the care of the Father in ways that allow us to rest, to admit our limitations and to rest and to find um, refreshment in the gift of rest. Lead us, we ask, O oh Lord. Amen.
Till my path is straight You are beside me You guide me for the sake of your name The King of Love My Shepherd is The thing I like If I hear Any affliction, a table is set. Perfume and oil, you, you anoint my head. You lead me by a stream, and I am in red. The king of love, my shepherd is the thing I like if I am here. The king of love will be with me all the day. When I walk through a valley I am not afraid When I'm lost in the shadow Still my path is straight You are beside me Guide me for the sake of your name The King of Love My Shepherd is The thing I like If I am here The King of Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. 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 Just before I close us today, I want to remind you of the event that we are co-sponsoring with Spark Church tomorrow night, Monday at 6.30 on YouTube, an interview with author Jamar Tisby, who recently re released a new book called How to Fight Racism. Jamar's is a voice that I have greatly appreciated learning from over the last year. And so I will be there and I want to invite you to come and join me and many others as we learn uh, from this wise voice of our time. Now I wanna leave you with a prayer of blessing. So if you're able where you are, I wanna invite you to set your hands on your heart and receive this prayer. 
the words of the last song that Kevin led us in, contemporary rendition of Psalm 23. They're beautiful, familiar words, but they're also challenging words. Lord, we pray that you would show us how it is that the words of this psalm are more than just poetry, but an actual expression of who you are and how it is that you tend to us as our loving shepherd. Lord, would you demonstrate your loving care to each of these, my friends, this week. Show how it is that they can trust you, that we all can trust you and enter into the gift of rest that we need and that our world desperately needs. Lord, as we experience your goodness, would you then make us beacons of your love and light to all who are around us? Friends, you are the instruments of God's peace in the world. So may the peace of God go with you into this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon.